Thank you, Pat Flynn, for being here. I can't believe you've never been here before. Well, I'm excited. Let's make it, let's make it awesome. <laughs> well, everything you do seems to be awesome. <laughs> I think that we can see that from the way that the world has responded. Um, for any one of our listeners that for some reason has been living under some kind of a rock and doesn't know you, um, I think we should start where it started. I think you should tell us a little bit about how this all got started and it started in, I think like 2008 ish. And you started with smart passive income. What the heck was that? What made you even think of doing that? Let's go back. Sure. Yeah. Let's go down memory lane for a little bit. And, you know, I was going to take you back to when I was born and start from there, but we don't, we don't need to worry about all that oh, stuff. Okay. Let's, okay. <laughs> let, let's start with, uh, like you said, 2008, which was a milestone year for me for a specific reason. I had been in the architecture world for several years. It's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I got my dream job. I got out of college and it was, everything was working the way it, it was supposed to, the, the way it was told it was supposed to. And then on June 17, 2008, I was brought into my boss's office and I was told I was going to be let go. And this was a huge blow for me. I didn't have a plan B, like I had done everything the way I was supposed to, and yet I still got let go. And my initial reaction was to be very confused. And then I was very upset, very angry, felt very ashamed, felt very at fault. And of course, this was 2008, which is uh, when the recession was going down. So it wasn't my fault, but I felt like it because I wish I could have done something better or different. And so I really had no idea what, what was going to happen. Timing wise, I had just proposed to my girlfriend, we were supposed to get married. So that I had that on the back of my mind, my parents paid my way through college. So I was like, am I letting them down? And so I ended up moving back home with my parents, which was like, you know, for a 25 year old kind of like moving backwards, right. And, and I didn't want to go down that route. My wife or my soon to be wife moved back in with her parents too, so we could save money. And I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, I kept begging and pleading to get back into the architecture world, and I even continued to put my resume out there, and, and nothing was happening, thankfully, because eventually I found something called a podcast, and on a podcast in particular, I found a story on a show uh, that featured a guy, his name was Cornelius Fitchner, and he was helping people pass the project management exam, the PM exam. Never heard of this exam before, but what intrigued me about his story was the idea that he was making over $100,000 a year helping people online pass an exam. And for me, having taken many exams as an architect and struggling through much of that, that was my big first aha slash light bulb moment where I realized, wow, maybe I could do this too. So I got very, very, very obsessed with learning more about online business and entrepreneurship, found a lot of dark caverns in the space, but I also found a lot of light uh, through a lot of communities as well. And I connected with those who were seeming, seemingly authentic and I ended up building my website to help people pass this architecture exam called the LEAD exam, very specific exam. And to make a long story short, in uh, by the end of the year, I, I, it ended up making more money than I ever did as an architect. Oh my and God. Kind of blew me away. But at the same time, as soon as I started making money from it, I soon started to have those feelings of this isn't what I was meant for. Maybe this is illegal. I have no idea because I'm I'm not a business person. I never went to business school or anything, and it just seemed unreal that I could wake up in the morning and then people all over the world would have downloaded my guide and there would be more money in my PayPal account. It just didn't seem real. Um, but I wanted to share it because a lot of people were struggling at the time. So I built SmartPassiveIncome.com, which is where most people know me from now, where I just kind of discussed what I did and what I wish I would have done differently, and kind of putting myself out there as like like the analogy I like to use is. Like in this world of online business, at least, I'm like the guy at the front of the trail with the machete, right? Like I'm just like taking all the scratches. I'm trying to find the right way. And sometimes I can find the right path and sometimes I don't. It, I get hurt every once in a while, but I do it for the betterment of everybody else behind me because I can pave that way for them. And of course, there's people ahead of me who have paved the way too, but I'm sort of clearing the brush to make it even clearer for people. And I don't always get things right but I always just share the way it is. And people seem to gravitate toward that authentic, transparent nature, including how much money I'm making, where it's coming from, where I'm spending money, what went wrong, all those things. And now 12 years later, um, it's become this giant brand and empire that's helping you know tens of thousands of people start their own brands and podcasting and books and speaking. And it's just crazy. It's just- and How insane. good does that feel? It, I, it, it's funny because a, <laughs> a lot of people who ask me to be on their show- go, oh, I'm sorry, but I want to have you like tell your story again. I'm sure you're sick of telling it all the time because I've told it hundreds of times, but I love telling it 
and being reminded of that journey because sometimes I forget. I forget how far I've come. I forgot what it was like. And that always grounds me. That always helps me stay more connected to those who are just starting out now. So I appreciate you for that. And, and to me, it feels very humbling. It feels very, uh, you know, I get mixed feelings of both, you know, being proud and excited and, and obviously feeling very blessed about it. But at the same time, I remember what it was like for people who this recent year, especially have gotten laid off and can't get a, another job and are struggling right now. So I'm, I'm doing it for them and I'm doing it for oh my, uh, gosh. my younger self, I guess. I mean, it's incredible. And you were building this well way before people were thirsty as they are now. I mean, now in COVID and the pandemic, when everyone is looking for what's actually sustainable, mm -hmm. you're right there with like 12 years of information and data and kindness and and pouring your heart into these people and so it's it's pretty cool the amount of meaning that that has the ripple effects of that if you were able to somehow see it like points of light on a spectrum you'd probably go mm -hmm. wow look how many things that i've helped to do which is such a gift um for you and for them obviously Thank so you. for for my audience who Let's see, we just passed 20 million downloads. We started four years ago, and I don't think we've ever talked about passive income, not one time, not once, Mr. Flynn. Congratulations, uh, by the way. That's an amazing feat. Oh my God, coming from you, it's like, come on, you're you know, way eons ahead of it, but thank you so much. Um, the thing is that we haven't talked about it. And so for people who don't understand what that machete has helped you to see, what, what are those paths that that machete has helped to clear? If I was going to even consider doing anything that looks like passive income, help us understand what those things might be. Well, one thing to realize is that if we're going to go down a path that has been never gone down before for you, like I want to prepare you, right? I want to let you know what's, what's ahead and, and set those expectations. I think a lot of people hear about passive income and they just kind of jump into it, right? It's like, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to start a website and get all the social channels. I'm going to build a logo. And then all of a sudden, they're in this thing that they've never been in before. They have no idea where they're at. And so that's why when I started, it was very important for me to connect with others who were already where I wanted to go. And that way, I could learn from their mistakes. And this is kind of why I'm here to share the things I've learned over, uh, over time. Um, the big thing to realize is that passive income is the last part of this entire process. You cannot make money tomorrow by just snapping your fingers or even just building something and hoping things take off. It does require a lot of work. It does require a lot of research. It does require a lot of failing, making mistakes, which if you're a perfectionist like me is a very hard thing to get over. You have to realize that your failures are moments of learning as you navigate through this forest, if you will, or this this bush, and we're gonna go through it together, right? And, and of course, the more that I can guide you along the way, the more we can both succeed together. So passive income being the law, last part because it takes a lot of active stuff in the beginning to get to the point where you can eventually and this is where the passive part comes you now have systems in place that can automate a lot of the stuff that you've built you have maybe a team of people who do those things that you initially had to do yourself whether it's coaching or consulting or whatever your special superpowers are right so it starts first with knowing how you can help a specific group of people because all good businesses, all all reward comes from service to others first. Your earnings are a byproduct of how well you serve those other people. And I think it was Zig Ziglar who said, um, nobody's ever gotten poor by helping other people get what they want. Now, the struggle with that is that oftentimes when I consider people who are just starting out, they go, oh, I want to build a business for everybody. I want to build the next Uber. I want to build the next fidget spinner, widget, whatever it is, right? And the trouble with that is you're going to set yourself up for a huge uphill battle by starting general. I like to say that the riches are in the niches, mm. even though it's niches and that doesn't run as well. <laughs> so it's riches are in the niches, right? Because the difference is like this. If you are, let's just take, for example, you want to start a shoe store, right? Online or, or offline, it doesn't matter. And if you just had like a shoe for everybody, you'd have a corner of your store that would be like the casual shoes. You had to have a corner of your shore store for the, um, the athletes. You'd have a corner of your store for the people who go dancing and clubbing or whatever, right? Like all these fancy shoes. And it's like, okay, when you walk into the store, it's, you, you, you kind of, you know, you're number one, you, there's a lot of things going on. And number two, the people who work there or even the founder necessarily aren't the expert on each of those things. They're just right. sort of more of a general population of, of, of the shoes. But, Consider that versus the running shoe store. You're going to start a shoe store for runners. 
you know that your target market is runners. You know exactly what they want, what they're going through. You know exactly that runners specifically, if they have a certain width of a foot, they need a certain kind of a shoe to go with it. People who go in the store, they can expect to get that kind of expert information because you're a specialty now. And it's so much easier to niche down because you have less competition. You can speak the same language as that target audience. You can start small and just help one person learn how to run. And that alone is going to unlock a lot of confidence in you and help you realize what it might take. Number three, number four, whatever number we're on now, it's like everything is so much easier from where to get these things manufactured. Who did, who did, who, like where these people go, where, where right. do they exist, right. right? If you want to market, just go to a 5K run and sponsor that. Now you're going to have runners all over you versus – if you have all the shoes, it's going to be very, very difficult. So start narrow. And the cool thing about this is too, and, and the last point here before I stop rambling and give you a chance again, is this idea that you don't need a million people. You don't meet, need a million right. followers. You don't need a million subscribers. This takes me back to an article that was written 20, uh, 2006, 2006 by a man named Kevin Kelly. He was the uh, editor, senior editor at Wired Magazine. He wrote this article that's still very famous today. It's called A Thousand True Fans. And the idea behind this or the premise behind it is that you don't need a blockbuster hit. You just need a thousand true fans, a thousand people who know you exist, who love your art, your craft, your service, programs, product, whatever. A true fan being somebody who like, you know, if you're a musician, they're going to drive eight hours to hear your set. If you have a product that comes out, they're going to buy it before reading the sales page because they just know you and love you. Now, imagine those a thousand true fans paying you $100 a year for your whatever it is. That's not much money at all in the grand scheme of things when it comes to fans. I mean, I spend thousands of dollars on Pokemon cards or Back to the Future stuff, right? And we spend more money on stuff that we don't even care about, like cable television sometimes, right? So a 1,000 people, $100 a year, that's a six-figure business, like already, when you think about it. A 1,000 people times $100 a year. And the crazy thing about that is that's one fan a day for less than three years. And you consider people who are working their nine to five jobs, who are, you know, may not even get to 100,000 ever, right. who are working for somebody else's dream, who won't have a direct impact on those who ultimately becomes the customer. I feel like whether it's on the side or full time, you can, you can have a fan a day. You find that group of people, you help them with a need or help them with something that's inconvenient, help them make it more convenient help them solve a problem. You can become somebody's go-to person. And that's what happened to me in the architecture space. A woman named Jackie reached out to me once and she said, Pat, you've helped me pass this exam. I was able to get a promotion. I'm able to go to Disneyland with my family now. Thank you. I'm your biggest fan. That's literally what she said. I just helped her pass an exam, yet I was having fans show up. And the crazy thing is three months later, I found out that Jackie, this is the beauty of fans, told every single person in her office to go get my same study guide that I, had, that I had made. So that one person, that one fan turned into 25 sales because she was so waving my flag high and adamant that I was the go-to person for her entire office. So mm. I'm going to stop talking there because that's how you go about it. That's the way I think business should be done good. in service of others. It's so good. And you wrote a book all about this. And I wanted to talk to you also about one of your other many books called Will It Fly? But before we go there, since you already brought up this whole thing about super fans, sure. Pat wrote this amazing book that just came out like very, I don't know, two years ago. Yeah. And we it's all about what you just said. So to go one step further, how does the book help us understand what's the first step into that? If I want to develop a thousand true fans. You're right. It makes so much sense that there are people working, building other people's dreams. They don't get to have the direct impact. They're sacrificing their entire life for maybe $40,000 a year. And you're like, mm -hmm. look, it could take you less than three years, one person a day. Great. I'm on board. Everyone listening is excited. What's my first move? How could I actually do that? Yes, great question. And I'm thankful because I knew this question would come up when writing this book. So I wrote the book in a way where it's very <laughs> actually step by step, right? It actually takes you through a progression because here's the truth. Fans aren't created overnight. You don't listen to a song for the first time. You love the song, but you're not a fan of the group yet. A lot of things need to happen. A lot of touch points, a lot of what I like to call moments need to happen. And it starts with that first moment. The first time people hear about you, find out about you or discover you, they don't necessarily care about you yet. 
They might be there because of information you shared or a podcast that they found or a problem that they're solving. But there's three things we can do in the beginning that can really activate them to now want to become more of an active audience member. So from a casual audience member, which is what I call them, to an active audience member. One way to do that is to learn the lyrics that your audience is going to respond to. And what I mean by that is like if the lyrics can resonate with that audience or the words you use in your email, on your sales page, in your podcast, if you're speaking the same language, right. that alone is going to help people go, wow, okay, you get me. Uh, this, mu this must be where I need to stay, right? There is a quote from a man named Jay Abraham who said, if you can define the problem better than your target customer, they're going to automatically assume that you have the solution. Right. So create content or put so yourself out good. there. So good. So <laughs> good. Thank you. <laughs> you know, put yourself out there in a way where people will then respond like this. Oh my gosh, finally, somebody right. gets it. Somebody finally understands where I'm coming from. I need to go to you. Okay. Now, can you help me since you know where I'm at? That's the kind of response you want to get. So, not just research that helps you learn what these problems are, but research that helps you pay attention to the word, like literally the words they're using, because you can just use those same words everywhere and people will know that you know what they're going through. So that's number one. Number two, put a little bit of your own personality into your stuff. Obviously, anybody watching or listening to this already knows that I'm a big Back to the Future fan. I've already talked about it once and I'm already, I'm actually wearing a t-shirt right now and there's a <laughs> hoverboard in the background behind me. Like that's just a part of who I am. Is it the center of all my stuff? No, but it shows up every once in a while because that's what makes me a person. That's what makes me a human being. And on the online space especially, it's not about the B2B or B2C, business to business, business to customer. It's about the P2P, the person to person or human to human interaction. Wow. We are more likely to do business with people because we care about them versus because of the product. So when we can understand this, we can be more comfortable showing up and just, guess what? Being ourselves and em embracing our weird because the truth is your vibe is going to attract your tribe. The more you put yourself out there, the more you're going to attract the people who like you for you. And you have to do it very genuinely, right? Like, because I know a lot of people, especially in places like YouTube, they'll rent the Lamborghinis, they'll rent the mansion oh for the weekend God. and the Airbnb. Then they'll bring the camera crew and they'll film and they'll be like, yo, what's up, guys? This is my mansion in the hills of Beverly, oh. whatever. And it's like, okay, cool. But what kind of people are you going to attract putting up that front versus like, you know, for me, my Lamborghini is a 2012 Toyota Sienna, right? That is my Lamborghini because it's so much easier to put the kids in and out of that van. So I love you. Is that really what you drive? Uh, we, that's one of our cars. Yeah. I'm like my friends at this point, he could basically own Range Rover and he's like, well, we have a van and I love it and I'm going to be proud of it. Keep going. I mean, this is amazing. Thank you. Full disclosure. Just, I mean, I have a Tesla. I'm a big fan of Tesla. I'm an investor. There we in go. Tesla. There we go. That makes sense. Come on. But I'll tell you, half the time we still drive the van, okay. like literally, because I don't want the kids with their ice creams in the Tesla. That's that's the real reason. <laughs> so um, it starts out with speaking the language. I love when mm -hmm. you just said that people will buy from you more because they connect with you as a person than because your product is so whatever perfect. And then I love this next thing about P2P. Mm -hmm. It just really does like, it feels like a relief. Like you can be yourself, right? Right. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So then the third thing is, I think people will say, great, I will speak into their hearts what I think that they are feeling and what I sure. hear them saying, and I'll be myself. But then my audience is going to say, how the heck am I going to stand out? There's already so many people. It's so, it's so crowded. How would anyone notice that I'm there? Like, they're so worried that they're going to start doing something and they only have 42 people on their Instagram. So no one's going to come. How do we help people understand that people will, they will wind up coming? Like, how does that actually work that it grows? Yeah, well, it grows almost by word of mouth many times. I've never, or I've hardly ever paid for advertising. Like, yes, advertising can work, but I feel like it will grow from within. This is the beauty of this super fan sort of uh, pyramid that I have, where you start at the bottom, they're casual audience members, they then convert to active audience members, meaning they're now subscribed because they know you and want like like you a little bit. And, you know, when you come out with something, they consider whether or not to, ch to check it out. And then they become a part of the community. And then they can become a part of the, su the super fans uh, within your audience. And the cool thing is when you do it this way, People who are fans or even just a part of the community, they're not necessarily super fans yet, but they will invite other people like them to come along. 
because people tend to hang out with other people like them. And they want to share the resources that are making them feel good and giving them a place to hang out and be weird together, right? Just consider, for example, Lego. Lego, the things that we step on in yeah. her if you have kids. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to describe them. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever heard of an AFOL, A-F-O-L. Do you know what an AFOL is? Mm -mm. It's, it's an adult fan of Lego. Okay. If you go to meetup.com and type in AFOL, you will find that there are thousands of members around the world. And I don't know about now because of the pandemic, but probably when we get out of this, it's going to be even more. Uh, thousands of meetings that happen all throughout the year in different locations all around the world. Because not just Lego people, adult fans of Lego now connect with each other. So now when an adult fan of Lego meets an another adult fan of Lego, for example, I found out recently that one of my good friends, Ryan Levesque, who wrote a book called Ask, is also a self-proclaimed a -fool. We have already have something to bond over, and we're talking about these different things that we're both involved with, inviting each other into them because we're like, oh, this is for you. Cool. Come in. This is a safe space. And this is the power of now what we have available to us with Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, Clubhouse, of course, and um, other more advanced membership tools like Mighty Networks or Circle.so, which I advise. And there's, there's so many opportunities to bring people together because people will come for the content but they stay for the community. And the community is not just you talking to them and them talking to you. It's them talking to and also finding each other. It's like if you're at a baseball game and your home team hits the winning grand slam, you're high-fiving and handshaking people you don't even know because you're wearing the same ball cap, right? And so this is the kind of environment that we can create in the online space that is probably even more sanitary than a, at a baseball game right now. So I think that with the idea of how do I get found, I think we need to pour our hearts more into those 42 people who are in our Instagram right now. Who are they? Why are they there? What, what are they struggling with? What might be able to help them? What are their biggest challenges and struggles right now? Know their names, have conversations with them, test things and experiment. Oh, I created this to help you. What do you think of this? Is this actually helpful? And as soon as you get a result from somebody, even just one person, it unlocks this confidence in your brain, but it also hopefully helps you realize that there are probably way more people out there that need your help who won't find you unless you get out of that comfort zone and, and share it. It's almost, it almost becomes your obligation, right? You've helped cure somebody's struggle. If you just keep it into yourself because you're worried or you're fearful or you're scared about what other people might say, well, that's a selfish way to approach it because there's other people now that you know that you might be able to help. Yeah, that's so good. And everything you just said is so helpful. It's about the depth, not the width. Everyone's like, I need more followers. And you're saying the complete opposite, no. which is how about the following is deeper and feels that you follow them and they follow you back. And when Daniel Pink was here, he said that he said, it's a moral obligation to sell yeah. something that you know that somebody else could benefit from. How dare you keep it to yourself? What a cool way to flip that around. So you kind of just alluded to part of what you talk about in the book that you wrote before that book, which is called Will It Fly? And I love this because so often people are listening to the show and they know, okay, Kath, all I know is I'm at the point where Pat had that conversation with his boss and I'm either mm. not able to keep my day job or I know I don't want it, but I have no idea if this thing that I do is a hobby or if this thing that I like, if this could ever become a business. How do we test a business idea? How do we validate? How do we get proof of concept? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad I wrote that book because this really solves that biggest problem when people are just starting out, which is just, how do I know? Right? And if you don't know, we often don't do because we're so right. scared. But the cool thing about this is this book is, again, step-by-step -step and built in a way that you can get like, you, you take this big goal that you have and you break it down into a bunch of little steps. And every step you check in with yourself and you go, green light or red light green light cool you keep going red light okay let's go back to the last green light and let's try this again and that way you can kind of take that iterative approach and it always starts with research first and one thing that i love to do is actually first have people internalize well what do you actually want because you as an entrepreneur can build your life in any which way you want right but if you don't know what that North Star is, you might get into a business just because of money or might go down a route and start something that you actually don't feel fulfilled with. And trust me, I've seen it several times at these conferences I go to or when I used to go to conferences, typically at night after everybody's done, we hang out in the bar, we're having a chat. When things are getting real, people are talking about real life at that point. And I can't tell you 
so often I hear people who are entrepreneurs who are so successful on paper from the outside, it looks like they got it all together, but then you hear the reality and they're like, man, I'm just not happy. I'm so overwhelmed. Yeah. I'm just yeah. not enjoying this anymore. I wish I had done something different. And it's because we jump into it so quickly. So the first part of the book is actually some self-testing to understand what is your actual goal? What are, you, what are your superpowers? So we don't force anything that's outside of that. How can we understand that we're actually moving down the right path for us first before we start choosing and inserting different ideas into that path, right? So that's sort of step number one. The next part of the book then has you go, okay, let's just like lay out all these ideas you have based on problems or fears that you know of other people or inconveniences, big and small. Let's just lay them all out, all out on the table and look at them because sometimes our brain, yes, it's an amazing tool that we can use to come up with several ideas, but unfortunately it's not great at organizing them as they come out. We need to put them on paper or put them on post-it notes and start arranging them in a way where we can start dealing with them because you can't deal with them until you see these ideas. Many times these ideas just right off the bat, okay, that I would never do that. Let me, let me crinkle up that uh, post-it note, recycle it. And now it's out of my brain because now I've given it a little bit of thought and realized, okay, no, no, not that. I'm going right. to make more room for something else. Other times, some kind of can cluster together. Wow, these are actually pretty similar. There's a pattern here. Maybe it's something related to this instead. And so there's some cool things that can happen magically when you do that. Eventually, you might get to the point where there's maybe two or three great ideas. And then you want to play that game with yourself where we travel into the DeLorean a year in the future. And let's just say idea A goes exactly the way that it should. What's your daily life like? How are you feeling? Are you fulfilled? If it went all to plan. Right. Let's come back to reality. Let's go idea number two path. Okay, how are you feeling now? This now gives you the idea to choose your path based on what you think might your ideal day be like in the future. Again, bringing yourself into it again, really important. And then once we have that one that maybe we want to try out, it's not the one that we permanently select, but at least we now have some direction based on ourselves, our history, and a little bit of just understanding of our brain patterns. Then we move forward into the finally, like the actual nuts and bolts research of this stuff. And the first thing I love to do is do what's called a market map exercise. I'm just going to tell everybody how it is right now. You don't have to get the book. If you want to get the book, awesome. But this is how it works. You create three columns in a spreadsheet. The first column um, is the places, all the places where this target audience might exist. So whatever it is that this problem is you're solving, where do those people go? Online, offline, groups, websites, conventions, every, just list them all out. This becomes a great exercise in where else are these people hanging and where should I go if I ever want to have a conversation with these people, which is, by the way, the next step. But <laughs> the second column, the second P, these are all P's, so places, then people. Who has already earned the trust of this audience? Who are the top players in social media? Who uh, are the personalities? Who are the people behind the podcast? Who is showing up? you know, on uh, YouTube, et cetera. Just like list them all out. Those are the people who eventually down the road, maybe you could partner with, maybe you could learn from, you can do some research within their brands to discover, well, why were they successful? What could I do that they've also done, but in my own way? And then number three, finally, is the products. What products, actual items that are for sale are available? Now we're starting to already piggyback off the work that other people have done to somehow in some way, shape, or form service this audience in some way. And then what happens is something magical. You have now a map in front of you of the lay of the land of this space. Remember, we're talking about the machete. Now we know potentially what direction we can go in yeah. based on maybe – where the more flat land is, or there seems to be some holes and some nice little, you know, areas over here, or over there. And we can now have our fourth and final P, which is our position, which is the position we're going to take in this new land. And this is a great way that we can understand how not to compete with somebody, but how to potentially complement something else that's out there. How might we be able to fill in a hole? So again, this book takes you through that process, but that'll give you just if, even if you get up to that point, that's another green light, red light moment. You have this market map and you look at it. Some people go, mm -mm, this doesn't look like it's for me. I don't like these people. I don't want to be a part of these places. How great is it to know that now versus two years down the road after you've tried to build something and then you realize it's not for you? It's so good to know that now so that we can move on. Or some people go, wow, uh, huge opportunity. I'm going all in on this, right? Green light. Let's move to the next step and actually start talking to people. So that's kind of how I would recommend getting started. I just have to say, I'm sitting here and I'm mesmerized by how generous you are. Like you've literally probably been on 
thousands of podcasts and you're still Close. this and you're still this animated and willing to be like let me pour it out all over again i like, love this that, stuff though like it this stuff changed my life how could i not get excited about it right it's like um this is just i, I don't know sorry i'm just this is genuinely this is this stuff fires me up because amazing, but that's why it's working pat because you are this genuine like it's so real for you that you're like I have to share this. I know this is helpful and I want to do it again and again and again and again and again. Like that is just very generous. Like at okay. your, the place where you're at in your career, you don't have to do any podcast. Like it's good to do it, right? Oh, uh, get a few more million people listening to your show. It's not the, the, the thing that's, if you don't do it, it's going to break you in any way. And the fact mm -hmm. that you're like so excited for someone new to hear it again for the first time. I just think that that's awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. Here's what also is driving me. I remember watching a video and it was a Gary Vaynerchuk video, you know, whether you're a fan of him or not, he says some real stuff, right? And he also has a lot of explicitives, which kind of sucks because I can't share them with my kids. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there was a video where a woman was in a car and she sees Gary walking on the street. She rolls down her window and she goes, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk, come here. She's like greeting him and he's like, yo, what's up? And, and she goes, hey, can you give one advice for the viewers? How do you stay motivated? How do you keep going? And how do you do what you do? Why? And he, he looks at the camera. He goes, you want to know why I do this? Because you're going to die. And it's just like a weird moment. We're like, wait, what, what did he just say? He's right. like, you're going to die. I'm going to die. I might die tomorrow. That's what's driving me because I might not have an opportunity to do this again or to be on this stage or to share this message. I need to show up every day because today might be my last day. And I think about that in relation to my business. I think about that in relation to my kids and, and how I show up for them too. And so we don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, I hope that wasn't morbid or anything, but that was very motivating for me when I heard it because I was like, yeah, that's kind of insane to think about. And it so, is. you know, I'm here today and, and I'm giving it all because, you know, the cool thing about podcasts is, you know, this will outlast me, which is pretty cool. So, you know, hopefully it'll help more people over time. And that ripple effect, like you said, it's like planting seeds. I'm going to plant one seed now, and that's going to create another plant that will then create more seeds, which will then create another plant. So it's so beautiful. That was so hard. That was just really like such a grounding thing to hear. And I'm sure you know this research that that hospice nurse wrote about what are the biggest regrets of the dying. And the number one mm -hmm. is exactly counter to what you said, which is, I didn't do it. I didn't show up. I didn't live life on my terms. I didn't do the things I wanted to do. And when yeah. you know that you missed it, you miss the opportunity and there's no more time. It's just so awesome. I want to ask you because my audience struggles with where is the place where I have to make a decision? This is what it seems like to people. I either get to do something I like, but I'll starve and I'll be poor. Or I will make something someone else needs or wants and I'll solve a problem and I'm back to being unhappy. Is there a way to have a real sense of joy and also have that radical empathy towards the other person? There's a book called Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. And in this book, they talk about the, 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 the human human brain in our gravitation toward just binary meaning this or that oh yes my god or no and, and so if you need help with decision making this book is incredible because it really dispels the fact that that's just our human nature to go oh i either need to quit my job or i need to just suck it up and, do, and stay here but be unhappy right well why not both right why not both and the reason why not both is because of what we hear in the media because of what we are just conditioned to learn over time, because this is very unusual. It's a very unusual time, not just during the pandemic, but in the information age to have the ability to potentially create something on the side that can serve people whilst also doing other things. So I think that, again, number one, what is very helpful and what was very helpful for me was to find other people who were doing the thing that I'm thinking of doing. To basically prove that thought this is impossible, wrong. Yeah. Because once we do that, then we go, oh, I guess it is possible. But then we start thinking the counter, which is, well, maybe it's just impossible for me. And then 
considering that thought, we need to prove we, like it, you know, we're a very emotional being as well as logical. But a lot of times when we have the uncomfort of thinking of do, trying something new, we start thinking illogically. We start thinking the worst thing possible. I remember when I started speaking on stage, like literally I started imagining people throwing tomatoes at me and like I would slip and break my nose and I'd wake up naked on a ditch somewhere. Like those are the legit feelings no and thoughts I had. Way, no way, no way. That's hilarious. Which of course is stupid. Like the, where would they get tomatoes? Like, <laughs> right? But we love to think about the worst case scenarios and our brain again comes up with ideas that are sort of unfathomable sometimes. But when we consider, okay, well, why might this be impossible for me? We actually, when you start to actually search for the truth behind that, you realize that there are no, there is no evidence often that proves that this is actually impossible for you. You just haven't done it yet. And that does not mean it's impossible. It just means you haven't done it yet. So stacking all these things in your favor from information to learning from failures to getting a mentor or coach or joining a program or whatever to help you, um, you can eventually prove yourself wrong. Yeah. So that's kind of the approach. It, it's all the mindset. I mean, you know this. This is no, all, I it's, love it. it's all the stories you tell yourself. I love it because what you're saying is that usually for kids, it's not what's taught, it's what's caught. And it's that was probably what was modeled. Mm. Like mommy and daddy are not happy. Deal with it. That's what happens when you grow up. You do something mm -hmm. you don't like. And you're saying just because that wasn't modeled for you doesn't mean it's impossible. Look for the evidence of people. In fact, that would be cool right now if anybody's listening and you want to do something right after this is like, go find evidence on Instagram of five people who have a, a platform, a career, writing, but doing things that they love and they're making money from it. And yep. you'll see that that is a path. That's, I, remember I told my story, Cornelius? Yeah. He had done it. That that's what gave me that wow, that's actually possible. Let's yeah. see see what I can do now. The the one thing I want to say, I'm sorry I cut you off there. You didn't. Because when we look at Instagram, you have to remember you're looking at other people's highlight reels. And when we start to compare your full life to somebody right. else's highlight reels, it can put us in a darker place. I fell into that trap uh as well. The comparison game we have to play is ourselves to ourselves yesterday, to ourselves last week, to ourselves last month, to ourselves last year. We can use others as inspiration. We can use others as proof. But when you start to go, oh, look how lucky they are. Look what they have. Look at that. They have four kids and their house is all white and they have no dishes. That's not real, by the way. And, you know, it's like. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's like you, you got to also like remember Instagram was made for taking amazing photography and you're only seeing a little square in their sure. life. So just, I wanted to, to, to have people realize that before yeah. you go and do this exercise. No, it's beautiful. It's true. Nobody has the perfect avocado toast and has sex every day and their kids wear matching plaid outfits at all times. That, yeah. and at the I'd same time. <laughs> <At the same. laughs> um, even better. So here's the thing is that my audience struggles with, but how Pat Flynn, how do I pick my thing? And now it's so overwhelming to, to pick my one thing that I'm not going to do anything. And I wonder what you say about that because everyone's always saying to me, but I don't know my calling. I don't know my one purpose. So yeah. forget it. And you started by teaching people how to pass an exam. And now you're doing like literally 11 other things that have nothing to do with that. Right. But this is what gets in people's way. I don't know my one thing. I don't have a purpose, a calling. What's the path to that when we're like, I don't even know what the answer to that question is. What's my calling? What's my purpose? My response is, how would you even know what that is? Why do you, why do you think you have to know what that is before getting started? You will discover what that is. As you, you might find that maybe you go and start coaching people on something that you have a skill on and you go, I don't like to coach people. I didn't know that. But now I do. So now I can pivot and move on and find that call. Right, right. It's just, it's similar to like, if you ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? I think that's the most unfair question in the world. Because how in the world could a kid even know what is available to them? We're almost forcing them in that question to choose between, you know, firefighter or baseball player, right? Correct. And that's all. Correct. And, or, or in, in, in my culture growing up, it was like, you're going to be this high prestigious, high paying job when you grow up, whatever that, you know, insert thing there, doctor, nurse, or, you know, whatever. Right. right. 
it's like, you don't need to know. And I hope that's a huge relief to you because you find out over time. But the truth is, and the only way to predict your future is to do nothing. Because if you don't do anything, nothing's going to change. It's not going to fall in your lap. And that's the difference between people who succeed and people who fail and wail. And I love to live a life full of OLs rather than a life full of what ifs, to your point earlier. So the OLs will teach you much more. The what ifs will eat you alive. I love what you said, because we've had almost 400 people here and they always have an answer for that question. And your answer was so different, which is, why do you think you have to know the answer to that? Like, why, what, what is that even? No, like how, and you're right, because that would presume you have all of the ice cream flavors in front of you already. And now you've already took, you haven't even seen like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what this world mm -hmm. has to offer. Exactly. That is a paradigm shift. That is incredible. Speaking of incredible, I want to ask you this question, which is you're literally a hit machine. You're like Taylor Swift as she is to songwriting, you are to making content. Like it is literally like another hit, another hit, another hit, right? What do you think makes content great? Like what are the pieces of whether it's your YouTube or your podcast or something you wrote, why is it working? Cause you've learned clearly a lot about what makes it work. Yeah, that's, I think I'm most proficient as a content creator more than anything. And over time, since starting the blog in 2008, the YouTube channel in 2009, the podcast in 2010, speaking on stages in 2011, writing books in 2013, uh, I've come to learn a lot. And so especially online, when it comes to blog content, YouTube podcast, whatever, uh, I like to think of the click and stick strategy. First of all, I need people to click. We got to get people to click. You could have the best content in the world, but if people aren't clicking on it to right. go and read it, whether it's an email or anything, it doesn't matter what you write. It doesn't matter how amazing the video quality is or the storytelling is. Sure. If you can't get people to click, you're not, you don't exist. And that's a scary thing to think about. So on the, in the world of YouTube, that's your title and thumbnail, right? That's it. That's literally all people have. So let's focus our efforts on that. And we've, over the past couple of years, have focused I would say 50% of our time is spent recording and editing the video. The other 50% of time is guess what? Trying a bunch of different thumbnails until we feel like we've gotten it right. Oh Trying a bunch God. of different of titles. It's, it's that important. And this has been verified. I, I saw Mr. Beast speak on stage at VidSummit a couple of years ago. His entire strategy, like we were like, it, it was like, you know, Mr. Beast's strategy for success, success on YouTube or something. He's like 50 million subscribers now. The whole, the whole talk was about his thumbnail strategy. Like legit, that was it. And many people were left disappointed. Like, oh, I thought you were going to give us these like secret things or whatever. It, no, just we focus on the click because <laughs> if you're not getting click, you're not getting watched. So that's the first part, the click, right? So And what is it? Can I ask you, what is it? Have you noticed as a pattern that makes people click? Is it the how... I'm going to throw things out there. How much celebrity is in the title? Is it how much information? Is it how scandalous the title is? Like what gets the most action in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. It varies per audience, but in general, there are indeed patterns. A lot of, uh, if, if there's information that you're sharing, how to blank. I mean, there's formulas out there, right? You can look right. at them. You can look at other channels, go to other YouTube channels. For example, if you're on YouTube, find your competitors or other people in your space, go to their videos and sort by most popular. Check out to see if there's any patterns with what kind of content that your audience that overlaps with theirs is most interested in. We found out recently that on my channel, it was always the five ways to, or mm -hmm. top 10 this, like numbers. People love numbers, you know, and, 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 and that's important. So, you know, Sometimes it's the storytelling, right? Like I, I have a new Pokemon card collecting YouTube channel that I just started last month. We're about to cross 10,000 subscribers in just a month, but we're imploring all these things that it. I'm learning. And this is like the next thing. And one of our things was, um, you know, uh, I, one of our titles was, um, this is the 2016 set nobody talks about. It makes you want to click on it because you're like, right. what, what, what are people not talking about? I need <laughs> to know, 
right? You don't even know, you're not even in Pokemon and you're like, well, what is it? You need to tell me it's generations, by the way. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's like, what are people not talking? about? like, I need to know what they're not talking about. And you're right. We right? have to know. So, okay. What's the next part? What makes them stick? What makes them stick? You need a good hook. Like again, the hook in the beginning, why should people even invest their time in watching this video or listening to this podcast? It is everything. Because if you can get, especially on YouTube, I get, again, I'm talking a lot about YouTube because there's a lot of algorithms at play that favor this kind of stuff that will help you get found by more people. But the same things apply on other platforms too. It's just, there's not as much of an algorithm, but it still keeps people listening and then they share it. But when people are watching your videos for longer, guess what YouTube's goal is? To get people to watch videos for longer. Why? Because that's more advertisements in front of people. If you can help YouTube get what they want, they're going to give you more of, of what you want too. So if you can get people to watch for longer, great. So you got people to click through, amazing. I like to share what's called the tiptoe strategy uh, at the start of a video. And this can work for podcasting too. I mean, there's many different ways to hook. You can hook people in by just getting them into a story right away. That's very compelling. You can hook people in by just telling people what they're going to get and having a consequence shared that if you don't listen all the way through, well, you might be spending way more on ads that you might need to. So you better stick around, Good. right? Okay, now I better listen or else I might spend more money. So a little bit of a hook slash benefit in the beginning is important. But this tiptoe strategy I love for videos. So the first, so this is an acronym, TIP. So T stands for title. You want to connect the title to the hook. Right. So that there's a, it's an ongoing sort of like progression. Right. So the title and thumbnail, you want to have something right away that connects to what they just clicked on and expect. Right. That's why every Mr. V Beast video is like, you know, you see a thumbnail and he's handing a credit card to a little girl and the little little girl's smiling. The title is I gave my credit card to strangers to see how much money they could spend in 10 minutes or something like that. Right. In the beginning of the video, he goes. In this video, I gave my credit card to complete stranger. Like it literally just goes right to it, right? It. There's no like, hey, everybody, Pat here from Smart right. Passive Income. I uh, thank you for watching this video. Uh, if you'd like to hit subscribe, let me know. You can see in, in the analytics, people are gone because people on YouTube especially are finicky. They want what they want. And if you don't give it to them, they're out, right? So let's just give it to them. So that's the title. And then also saying like in this video, that's the I, like literally just tell people in this video, this is what you're going to learn. You need to be that clear because then people can go, oh, okay, I guess I'll stick around for that, right? P is proof. When you show proof about what it is you're talking about, right? You've captured their attention. Hopefully you're using, like we said earlier, lyrics or language that they respond to. The P is proof. Here's why this works. Or let me show you how this worked. Hey, in this video, I'm going to share with you how you can reduce your Facebook ad campaigns by half the price. I just did these exact strategies last week and look at these details right here. We were able to convert at half the price. And this is what I want to show you. And at that time, of course, maybe showing on the screen certain dollar values and something just to kind of, again, prove what you're talking about. Then we can tease. This is the toe part, T for tease. Let's share some things, like one or two things that are going to be later in the video or later in the podcast or later in the blog post that will get people go, well, I can't leave now, right. <laughs> right? It's like, okay, and there's even one special tool that you can get that's completely free to use that will help you be able to keep track of things much easier, but more on that later. Uh, tell me, please. Okay, I'll watch right. the video. So right? so that's the tease. And then the O is the objections. And this is really important for sales of any kind, whether you're selling people into a program or selling people on the time they need to invest in this thing. The O is the objections. You need to call them out on the objections, right? For example, if I'm going to teach people how to start a podcast on a video, I might say, you know what? I know you might, what you might be thinking. You don't like the sound of your own voice. Or you might also be thinking that you need a big audience already in order to succeed. Or you might think that you don't have what it takes to succeed as a storyteller and a communicator. Well, I'm here to tell you that all that is false. So make sure you, so when you, again, can call people out and just say, hey, yeah. I know what you're thinking, but that's not true. Right. People are going to go, oh man, you got me. You got me. Okay, I'm yeah. listening. Tell me, tell me then. And then the, 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 the E at the end from tiptoe is just, then you get into the explanation. Right. Then you can talk, then you can share, then you can sort of advise. So good. Last question before we are going to jump is you just mentioned it and you've done so, so much of it, which is helping people start their own podcast, which is also so generous because 
you're not look at me, you're come with me. You're like, this is working for me and it's so fun. Let me teach you exactly how I did it, which is really nice. Um, I want to ask you about that. Two things. One is you have a YouTube channel, which is so successful and a podcast and you've done blogs and books. Why podcasting? Why does that stand out to you? Why didn't you want to double down and triple down teaching other things? Why did you go there? What is it about podcasting? If you remember the story I told earlier, it was a podcast that I heard that interview right. that changed my life. I felt like I had a relationship with the hosts because I listened to them every single day. And when you consider a podcast that you're listening to, if you're this far in this podcast already, you've been listening for probably 55 minutes at this point. I don't know. Maybe maybe I nailed it. Maybe no. not. But kind of around there. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of time for all of us, not just you and I, but the listeners as well to be together and we're building a relationship at the same time. That's so much time. That's almost a whole hour of a 24 hour day. On YouTube, if you can get people to watch your videos for five minutes, you're doing really well on YouTube. On a blog post, if you're getting people to read a blog post for 10 minutes, people aren't even reading every word, they're skipping around, that's good. On social media, it's like 30 seconds and you're out. Here on a podcast, people are listening to 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, other podcasts, three or more. That's so much time, and it's because of how we listen or where we listen. Right now, you might be listening to this. Maybe you're on a run or on a walk with your dog. Maybe you are at the gym. Maybe you are in a car. Maybe you're on a plane. doesn't matter. But you're probably in places that you probably wouldn't normally watch videos, and this is why this platform is so powerful. Plus, I have a lot of students, so that's like benefit number one, a lot more time with the people listening which of course, everything in, in business is about relationships and every, it's connection. Right. Number two, I have a lot of students who come to me and when I ask them, why do you want to start a podcast? It's funny because they're like, oh, I don't care how many listeners I get. I'm like, really? They're like, I just want to have a platform to connect with other leaders, other industry folk, just like how you and I are connecting right now. And you and I are building a relationship at this very moment versus if I were to just ask Gary Vaynerchuk again for 15 minutes of, of his time, he would tell me to F off. But because I saw he had a book coming out and I said, hey, I'd love to invite you on the show and get more listeners and have more people buy your book. I'll even buy a few of your books, but you can come on the show and talk about the premise of it. He said yes. And so he was on my podcast. Tim Ferriss was on my podcast. Ramit Sethi, Shalene Johnson, all these amazing people who otherwise I would have never built a relationship with. We're now friends and doing things together, partners even in cases because of the podcast. And then finally, podcasting is meant for storytelling. Really, I feel like it's, all, it's a platform that's perfect for storytelling because stories are what people resonate with. It's what we remember. It's how we remember information. It's similar to like how a song can help us remember the alphabet. A story can help us remember information. And you have a lot more room to tell stories here on a podcast without worrying about a person leaving halfway through because, I don't know, it's YouTube. So we have the ability to make that deeper connection. People are just fine tuned to listen to stories and transform because of stories. It's what were read when we're kids. It's was what was written on cave walls before the spoken language, it, just like story, story, stories. And when you tie that into your business, imagine inviting your own students, your own customers on your podcast to tell the story of what life was like before and then oh what life God. is like now after. And of course your product is in the middle of that there's nothing more powerful when it comes to sales. So it could be used for all those things. It's so good. I just want to ask a follow-up to that exact thing and then we'll, we'll go, which is how many of your students have been able to not only start a podcast, but how do they monetize it? Like, cause people will say to me, all right, well, you already have so many downloads. Like, obviously you can do that, but am I going to be able to get ads right away? And I'm always like, I don't think so. Let me think about that. What's your no. answer to like, how do you monetize it if you don't have millions of downloads, if you only get to like 600 or 12,000 sure. even? If you if you believe that advertising and sponsorship is the only way to monetize, then you, it's going to be very difficult for you to monetize. You need to be in the upper echelon of downloads. I would say at least 25,000 download, 25, downloads a month to begin to even have conversations with companies right. who would want to get in front of you. However, right. that's decreasing because a lot of uh, companies are realizing the bond between the podcaster and the podcast listener so strong. So a lot of companies are willing to still work with smaller audiences. So don't feel like you need 25,000 before you can monetize with ads, but that's kind of usual. But there's three other ways that you can monetize. You can monetize through selling your own product. 
right? You might have a coaching program, a consultation, you might have a course or a book or something. So you could sell that obviously on your podcast. If you don't know what that product is, guess what? You can use your podcast to bring people into an email list and then see what people are struggling with to then create that product. Even simpler than that, you could do what's called affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing means promoting or recommending other people or other companies' products that already exist, that are already selling. You could just become the person that recommends it. Right. And that's like a natural thing that we do anyway. We recommend things to our friends and our family. Well, your audience are people that you should care about too, and it would behoove you to share the thing that's helped you with them as well. And guess what? As a result of, again, remember, everything comes from a place of service. A lot of people think affiliate marketing is like, oh, well, they're, you're just making money off of people. Well, guess what you're doing for them? You're weeding out all the noise from all yeah. the options and all the things in the world out there, and you're giving them the exact tools or services, programs, whatever that they might need. That is of service to them. You're saving them time. So you can sell and serve at the same time is the big, is the big key there. So affiliate marketing, whether it's physical products that you can purchase on Amazon, you sign up to Amazon's associate program, which is our affiliate program. Did you know Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's also has an affiliate program? Um, or other programs that you already use, products. Start with what you know is going to help your audience and stuff that you've already used. And then finally, you could take a fan-based approach where your fans can support you through tools like Patreon. And just imagine this, going back to our 1,000 true fans. Imagine you had uh, one episode per week, so four per month, and you were just like, hey, fans, you don't have to do this, but if you want to support the show, it's really helpful. It helps pay for the editor and all the things to, to, to continue to bring this information to you. For just $1 per episode, $4 per month, you can support the show. That's less than a cup of coffee, and I'd love to, to have your support. If not, no worries. So now you have a dollar per episode, four episodes per week for one person. Imagine you have a 1,000 true fans. You have $4,000 a month coming in from your fans now, right? That's doable. That's doable. And there's some people I know who are making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a month from little micro instances okay. like that from their fans because they their fans just love them, but they've showed up for them and they deserve that. And you can too. You can have that happen for you as well. Oh my God. It's been jam packed. So good. If you were driving, you need to go now and re-listen <laughs> and take notes. Tell us where we can become more of your fan. Where do we get your books and where do we get learn from you and watch your YouTube and listen to your show shows, all of Thank the you. things. <laughs> Thank you again for having me. I appreciate you all listening in and, and I hope this was intriguing to you. I imagine in the future, one day, years down the road, you and I will cross paths and go, man, it was that episode with that. I remember that first episode that changed everything for me. Uh, and and I, that, that's kind of what I shoot for those future moments. So if you want to find me and, and connect with me, there's several places you can do that. But Pat Flynn is the, na the name to know. That's the uh, at Pat Flynn on Instagram, on Twitter, on, uh, you know, Pat Flynn on YouTube as well. Uh, Smart Passive Income is the place if you want to get educated on a lot of this stuff even further, whether for free or through some of our programs. And of course, the Smart Passive Income podcast is easy to go to from here. And then all the books are on Amazon. So Superfly, uh, Superfly, <laughs> Super Fans, <laughs> Will It Fly? Um, and, and my other book, Let Go, which goes deeper into, you know, what I had to do to bounce back from a layoff mentally. But yeah, that that's it. And just super appreciative of your time. And thank you for having me on the show. Super appreciative of your time. And 